Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. We are solidly in the third part of the course now and after introducing design patterns and giving you two examples by uh, not common examples uh, which were value objects and type objects, we will now turn towards an example of a whole little language of using patterns to cover a particular domain here, the creation of objects. So we will go through the through existing well-known patterns for creating objects and we will see how they put next to each other. Each have strengths and weaknesses which you need to understand so that you choose wisely as you pick one particular pattern to solve a problem over the other. And that is in some sense the key lesson here. Don't randomly, don't overzealously apply patterns all the time, but rather think about do I really need that pattern here? Is the implied structure maybe overkill or is it just appropriate for the problem at hand? And once we have done that, uh, once we've gone through our examples, we will actually recognize that all these patterns next to each other cover a small but important domain, the domain of how to create an object uh, nicely. And so we will review this and put things next, next to each other to give you a decision model of how to think about creating your objects right. So there are a couple of well-known patterns that we'll start out with on how to create an object. The first one, switch case, uh, the switch case idiom or programming language function is not really a pattern. It's baked into most, uh, most programming languages, but it figures in here. And the others, factory method, abstract factory, product trader and prototype are clearly uh, design patterns all four have been defined and made public uh, widely known by the through the design patterns book and we will use an example now uh, where we will apply this pattern the example is the design and implementation of a desktop uh, software uh, where you can see applications and documents you will probably just see the documents and the applications are implied because if you have a text document, then maybe you need a text processing application to work on that document. And the creation challenges, the object creation challenges, given that there are different types of documents and different applications for the different document types, um, we will, the challenge is to go from one to each other, starting with a document, how do you find the matching application, having an application, how to create the proper uh, document from it. Here's an example, simple uh, design, where you might have a client, the desktop, which knows uh, the application uh, class and then the subclasses uh, for text processing, for uh, spreadsheet calculations and for slide design. So this is modeled after OpenOffice, LibreOffice, so Writer, Calc, and Impress, similar to Microsoft Word, um, Excel, and PowerPoint. And for each of these applications, there are the corresponding documents in the internal structure, and there are subclasses of document, and then you have file types that identify the file type so that you can choose the right application. As I said, this is about understanding different design alternatives. So we need an evaluation model of comparing and then deciding uh, about which pattern to choose. And mostly now this is about ease of understanding. So finding and reading the code, how easy is that? Uh, understanding the code actually that's different from finding and reading the code if the code was spread all around it might not be easy to read probably is also not easy to understand 
but if it's all in one place, finding and reading it might be easy, but maybe still not understanding it. Uh, changing the code, how easy is it to change the code? And also how easy is it to extend the code if there are changes in the design and the requirements with respect to creating applications and documents. So let's look at uh, the first uh, very basic uh, way of creating objects, the switch case statement. So that's suitable if um, you need to go, for example, from a file type to the document class. So the desktop class presents to users all the documents they have and the document has a file type to simplify identifiable perhaps by the file extension. So a dot doc or a dot uh, ODP or uh, PPT um, X uh, for, uh, for some type of document. And so with that information, barely a string, you need to find out which document class to instantiate and load the identified file into. How to go from a file type to a document class and instantiate that. And with switch case, it's pretty straightforward. We have a method in the desktop class called create document. It has a gets a file or a file type from the file, which simplifying here is just a three character string, ODT, ODS, and ODP. And that uniquely identifies either a text document, a spreadsheet, or a presentation. And so you write an um, if then else or switch case. Um, that's logically effectively the same. I'm using if then else here because the dispatch on the string is not so easy. If it was more, if it was just a single character or a number, the switch case could also have been applied. But conceptually, switch case is the same as this if then else cascade. And so hopefully you will find the matching document from the file type and you will return it then uh, the new object and uh, to uh, load the file into. So it's straightforward, pretty simple, uh, no surprises. And the advantages is uh, it's very easy to find. That's just one create document method and read. Easy to understand and even easy to change. Yeah, you just extend it in place. Um, it is, however, that you just change it in place. It is, however, hard to extend if you want to add new types of new types of documents because you have to go exactly to this switch case statement which um, means that you have to uh, change this particular method recompile the system and deploy it anew you can't dynamically load it on new classes or configure it at runtime also um, Nothing is said beyond the actual finding of the class of the text document and its empty instantiation. So the initialization may be an additional step and we will come to that later. So let's look at um, the next pattern, factory method. We'll actually have to switch the example a problem for that before we return to going from file type to to document um, class. So now we want to create a document from an application. So this time the user chooses the application first, maybe starts it and wants to start a new document. The client is the runtime environment, again, the desktop, or maybe it's even the new function in the application. And so the um, user wants to create a new document for that application. And uh, you can use the factory method uh, pattern to do just that. And if you uh, apply the factory method pattern, what you do is to have a method, the factory method, which in this case is an abstract method in the superclass application. And then in each subclass, uh, override that 
factory method and implement it in such a way that it returns the matching text document for that application class. So in the writer class or the word class, you will create a text document. In the calc or Excel class, you will create a spreadsheet document and, in the, uh, and so forth. And that delegates the knowledge of the type of document to create into the subclasses. You could, of course, have a switch. Uh, you could, of course, try to put it all into the application class and then tech and then uh, switch case on what type of application am I. But that way you would have to change the application class all the time if there are new, uh, new documents. The idea here is that maybe there's not just three application classes forever, but there will be a hundred more. And hence, in the application class, like in any good framework, there's a design a domain model, which involves that there should be a create document class, a method. But you don't know yet what the document is, because all the future application classes that have not been programmed yet will only know this by themselves, because they come with their document objects only a year into the future. So that's why it's an abstract factory method you don't know about. It's uh, various sub forms yet and hence you delegate it to subclasses how to uh, instantiate the matching document for the given application. So it's not so easy any longer to um, find that code uh, to understand it. Maybe it's okay because you can see how the gen generic application code uses the create document method, which then falls through by way of um, polymorphism to the specific or late binding to the specific subclasses methods implementation. Uh, but that's already a bit more dynamic than the switch case. But at least it is easy to change and certainly it's easy to extend because extension only happens if you introduce a new application class where you just override this one particular method. So that's the strength here. And in your class you need to introduce, does not have to know about any other application classes, it's nicely decoupled and thereby extending the system is comparatively easily done and really focuses and is contained to exactly the one thing that you need to extend and nothing more. The disadvantage is that there is no global overview uh, of creation code any longer, but that's the whole point. You have no global overview of the future and what applications the future might bring. So the next pattern is the abstract factory. Factory method is probably the most common one of the creation methods and after that it's uh, abstract factory. We're going back to the first challenge uh, which we solved by way of the switch case statement or the if then else cascade where we want to go from a file type uh, to the document identified by that file type. And um, so it's again the desktop object where the user clicks on some file and so now the desktop knows the file type, maybe by uh, the extension uh, string or the MIME type or what have you of the file that needs to go to the matching document uh, class for it. And uh, also we really want to make it easy to extend or add new document types now. So for that, we introduced the concept of a factory, which is a separate object that handles the creation of new objects, that fabricates new objects, hence factory. It is called, uh, so here it's the app doc factory, because it will be creating both applications and document objects in the future. And so in its interface, it knows or it has methods like create document and create application or instantiate application. And um, it will require the corresponding parameters, for example, create document from file type. In its interface, it does not know about the specific application and specific document types, which is why 
this factory as a pattern, and the pattern name is called abstract factory. It only returns an application object, statically typed to be an application, and a document, uh, statically typed to be a document. And at runtime, it may be the different, maybe instances of the different subclasses of application or document. And then also, though not so particularly relevant here, but in the past it was, you really had these different platforms, so you needed different uh, subclasses or different variants of the app doc factory for different systems or different window managers, one for Linux, one for Linux, and under Linux or Unix, um, when the patterns were created for many different Unix variants. Anyway, here you can see again, as just explained, the interface of the app deck app doc factory uh, class or interface here and the key thing are these two methods create a document from the file that the user has clicked on and create an application from an instantiated document so maybe the user first clicks on a file and uh, from that the document is created and then the desktop comes again and says oh with that document now dear app factory create the application so that I can start working on the document. So these two create from methods are maybe called soon right after another. And um, how this is implemented uh, can now vary. That's the interesting thing. The idea of the abstract factory is that it is its own object or its own class so that at runtime the creation of the objects desired is pulled out into that factory object separate from the client and client code. So thereby anyone who needs an application object or a document object will not program any longer their own methods but delegate the work to that factory object. And then within the creation methods of the factory, you can choose different types of finding the specific class. Here I'm using the switch case, but in the original example of the design patterns book, it was not using switch case, but rather factory method, because the interface, the factory interface was implemented through different classes, again, for the different platforms, Windows or Unix uh, back then. And so we can already see a decoupling of separate issues here. The delegation of the object creation from one's own object to a separate factory object. And then the choice of the method implementation that actually implements the specific object in place. So the advantages of the factory is the factory is actually easy to find and read. And because it's also all in one place, it's easier to change. Uh, and it's certainly easier to extend than the switch case, though maybe not perfectly easy to extend. Because the code is now spread around more, even though you know where to find it, I'd argue it's easier to understand. So having separate factory objects that you delegate work to is actually pretty versatile. You, you often do that, not just for factories, but you use delegation like this often if you want to have some task, some function brought together in some object that has this primary or even single sole purpose. And so um, you consolidate all the object creation in that factory and nothing but the object creation. And um, as we saw, then further methods might apply. Now, yet another pattern is the product trader design pattern. That one is not in the design patterns book, but it's a very common uh, one where you go from a specification of the object um, to the actual to the class of the object, which you then instantiate. It's actually it's, um, uh, the going from the file type to the class as an example, but the switch case is not a good solution for that, or at least not a flexible solution that product trader wants. So here again, the desktop is the client that wants to go from a document 
document that it uh, created to, uh, to the application. So how to create an application object for a given, uh, for a given uh, document and then that there are given that there are possibly new application types in the future and corresponding document types, how to have that all in one place. And the product trader here is basically the uh, using the factory to be that place where the creation code is written. But the idea of a product trader is that you introduce a map where the key is the specification of what you're looking for, and that will be the document type. And then the key is the class of the application that matches the specification so that you use the document as a key to look up the application class, which you then instantiate uh, for further processing. And that is different from switch case because it's obviously dynamically extensible at runtime. You don't have to write new code. You just have to change this mapping or the map um, at runtime. So you can see it here. There's a map from class to class called app classes, where the key class is the uh, class of the document that you use as the specification. And the value or the uh, lookup class is the application class that you need to instantiate for a given document. So text document dot class maps to writer dot class spreadsheet dot class maps to calc dot class etc. A very simple example also by the way of how type objects are useful or in this case the class objects because suddenly you're stepping going up one level to the model or type object level and you're using that type information to configure your system and make it more flexible at runtime. With this mapping in place, you can now write code that looks up the, class, the application class to instantiate from a given text document and then create that application class once you identified it and return it. So you can see that here and um, the uh, map gives you the mapping and the and is configured uh, during system startup time usually by way of the register application class method here and then in the application in the create from method you look up the application class and create an instance for it now the logic is simple and prose human language makes it easy to talk about it but of course if you've written code like this you know that it will be messy because again we are on a type object level now or more specifically we are using the uh, facilities of java.lang.class to create objects so it's not as easy as writing new which is a built-in language feature but on the class object we've got to call it method called new instance. We've got to handle all the exceptions. So while this is programmable, it is not nice to read code. But you only have to write it once. And then you have hidden your, uh, your uh, the, the uh, not so pleasant uh, code in these methods, hopefully with proper error and exception handling. And then they will do their job and the clients just found that their life got so much easier, which is why we're doing it in the first place. So the, the code is easy to find and read. It's even easy to change and extend once you understand it, but it's much harder to understand. Uh, and certainly also much harder to debug. But the benefit is that it's really flexible because the product trader pattern delays everything until runtime. The configuration, which document class maps to which application class, the code that execute that, imp, that instantiates the, doc, the application class, and so forth. And the product trader, as I said in the beginning, is effectively a factory. So in the past, the product trader was called a trader and not a factory. But uh, if you me make the factory, the abstract factory pattern to be general and not tied to 
an implementation of the creation methods by way of the factory method pattern, but just any type of implementation, then you basically can merge product trader and abstract factory into a factory pattern where the creation methods can choose from any of the other creation patterns, object creation patterns to actually carry out the instantiation of a particular class. And that's actually a positive step because that is the flexibility a designer usually wants. Uh, they recognize they want to delegate work to a separate object. That's the factory. They don't necessarily want to be tied to the use of the factory method pattern inside an abstract factory as the only choice for creating uh, instances. So there's yet another way of thinking about object creation that I want to look at, opening up a new design dimension. Uh, that's the prototype pattern. The prototype pattern, unlike product trader, but like the others, is part of the design patterns book. And um, we will use it uh, to go from file type uh, to document. Um, and it's uh, third third version. And um, so we again have the file type, want to find the matching document type, and we want to specifically then set up uh, the document object and not just the empty one, possibly a complex uh, document, because, well, these documents tend to have complex structures. So for that, we stick to our factory, even though we could also put it into client code, but I just like the delegation of the creation work to a factory object. And now we use the now we use prototypes to stand in for the classes of the objects we want to create. All right, let me stop here. What what's happening or what is a prototype? So a prototype is a prototypical instance of the object we want to create. And so we know we want a text document or we want a spreadsheet document and so forth. So we actually instantiate that class to give us an object. And then we single out that object of all, among all the other objects and say it's special, even though technically it's just the same class still. But we treat it sec separately as a prototype from which by way of cloning rather than instantiation, from which by way of cloning, we create further instances. This makes the prototype serve like some sort of class. And it also lets us set up complex structures, which we get free freely if we clone the prototype properly. In the old days of the design patterns book, for example, uh, programming languages did not have good, or some did not have good support for a meta level or modeling level. C++ barely had type info back then, and that was just a struct and not a class. Java only came about in 1995 or later, and so class objects also came later. In programming languages with no classes, one way of helping yourself was to instantiate each class, single out, and single out that one instance as a prototype, which effectively served as a class representative. So in the class interface, then you needed two separate sections, one for the regular instance methods that the domain expected you to provide, and one set of functions that were class level function, like give me a new instance, which would be implemented by cloning the object. All right, back to, back to this here. So it's a factory and similar to trading, we register the prototypical object that represents the particular document class, be it a spreadsheet or a text document or a, a presentation for a given file type. That's register document prototype. And then with that, we can also have a create from method where from the file type, we go to the prototype and instantiate it. So similar to trading, except that we don't use classes, but prototypes, we have that registration method where we configure the map, the mapping from 
uh, in this case, the file type to the document. So not from uh, document to application class, but from a string file type to make life easy to the document class. And that's the configuration in the register class uh, method. And then when it comes to creating, if a client asks for, uh, for a new object uh, that matches uh, this specific file type, then that just becomes a lookup and the creation of that desired object becomes simply a cloning of the prototype. And here you can see it. There's the lookup of the prototype and the create from method. And then to create the new instance, there's the pro cloning of that prototype, which requires that you have to have that clone operation implemented cleanly, which can be a challenge. So that is easy to find and read because it's all in one place, easy to change because you just change the configuration easy to extend. It's like the trader, basically. It's a bit easier than the trader, perhaps, because we are not going to the meta level and use the meta object protocol, but we use a self or a homegrown uh, interface based on cloning. The dynamics also make it harder to understand than maybe the traditional switch case. So, now, I have shown you a couple of design patterns that are good for their respective purposes. They kind of overlap. It may not be easy to say which one's better, trader or a prototype, factory method or switch case. Do I need a fact abstract factory? And because that can be confusing, but Fortunately, the complexity of the domain is limited. I want to break this down now into its constituents parts. So first of all, as just noted, uh, there's clearly an overlap between the, the pattern, between the patterns. And also, they do multiple things at once. So the factory method, for example, has the code for creating the object, all right, but um, by the way you subclass or override, you also configure the system. Um, the prototype um, pattern, for example, uh, gives you that creation method, the cloning, but it also initializes the object in a complex way. That was the idea of the prototype. It's not just the root object of the possibly deep clone, but uh, a complex object structure. Now, that's intentional because that's the pattern. If we were to break everything down into its smallest constituents parts, constituent parts, we would be at the programming language level and be looking at the functions of the programming language. So the pattern here is the so frequent combination of these uh, various aspects that uh, experts observe that's how they always do it. And that makes turns the combination into a pattern. But by going the other way, maybe we get more flexibility or maybe we will get closer to the original dream of a pattern language or flexible use of these patterns. And also who says that a design pattern once written is cast in stone. Maybe it's improvable. Who knows? So I want to look now at object creation where after what you've seen, you may want to follow me when I tell you that there really is a design space in which these six different decisions have to be made. The first decision is delegation, yes or not. So who's responsible for creating the new object? Is it yourself or is it a separate factory object? Then selection, uh, how is the specific class uh, selected in the code and then configuration can you change uh, the selection process can you configure it also once you have the concrete class how is it instantiated uh, by what way was it new is it cloning is, is the matter object protocol and 
also initialization now that you have that new object how do you initialize it when do you initialize it similarly to not just the new object but any larger object structure behind it how do you build it so these are six uh, these are six independent dimensions that I want to largely independent dimensions maybe the final word has not been said yet that I want to discuss So that's the object creation model that I'm just taught that, that I just talked about. It's uh, the design space consists of who to delegate to, how to select select the concrete class, how to configure which class it is you get, how to instantiate that class, how to initialize the resulting object, and how to build complex object structures. Now, these are the dimensions, but what are the values? Or what are the options in these different dimensions and here is my analysis by looking at the example patterns which represent what experts need and want and breaking it down into its constituents part so delegation so who gets to create the object that can be done in three different ways uh, where you're writing the code right now then that's one option then a second option is still in the object that you are in but at least you delegate to a separate method that's the second option and then the third option is to wholly delegate the creation to a separate object usually then called a factory so three different options and you have to decide every time you create an object you have to decide where is the code, where to put the code, what object owns the creation process. And that gives you more or less flexibility, makes the code easier or harder to understand. Then as you know where to put the code, you still have to decide how do you, you have to decide how do you find out about the concrete class. And here are five options. So on the spot, you just hard code the class, new something, new text document. Um, and there's only one option. Or you switch on a certain selection uh, or specification, but you switch in place. And so you make a choice, but it's still in that place and it's hard coded. The mapping from the selector to the selected object here, the class, is hard coded in a single place. Um, if you delegate to a map method this task, then you can override it in subclasses. So different subclasses now select uh, which class is to be instantiated. They could be returning a class object or they could be creating the object right away and so forth. And you could also be um, mapping um, or collocating the class to be created, instantiated. How do you configure any such mapping? Well, um, there are different ways. We only discussed so far the encode. Well, I get, simply simply had registration methods, so that's the methods you call to configure the uh, factory, for example, or the trader. But we didn't discuss really where that calls came from so you could be writing initialization code where you just have a long list of register this for that method calls um, you could use annotation so arguably um, dependency injection is a way of doing that or you could have the information in a configuration file and read that configuration file and turn it into a sequence of calls um, of the registration or mapping creation methods so now we know where the code is, how to select the class, and how we possibly configure which class gets selected. And now that we have the class and are at the place where the instantiation takes place, then how do we do that? Well, again, it's the simplest form is you just write new something if you know the class right away. If you're holding a class object, you're using the meta object protocol. If you're using a prototype, you are cloning the prototypes, you're calling a very set difference function, not going to the meta level, you're just calling clone on the 
prototype representing the class or even you could delegate the whole object creation process to a separate function object that in some sense is the most focused, limited, smallest way of having a separate object uh, perform the instantiation. Not a full-blown class object, not a poor man's approach to class objects like a prototype, just a strategy or policy or whatever function object where all it does is create that object. So the encode could be moved, so the encode solution where you hard code new something could be uh, provided by a pure creation function object that does not contain all the additional stuff of a class object or prototype, but where all its purpose is to just create the object, a single function, function object, as the name says. Uh, once you have that object, now you may still need to initialize it, so it gets perhaps initialized emptily. So you call new on it, and that would trigger the empty or default constructor. If you use cloning, then you would get the copied structure, then you would get the copied cloned, the copied clone that might be a deep clone, a complex structure even. Um, you could agree on not calling the default empty constructor, but you could decide that you need, uh, that you want a fixed signature because it's always the same. So you have a set of defined parameters. So you have a fine defined signature and hence all the methods carry around that particular signature until you reach the place where you actually initialize the object. If that is too cumbersome because, well, you have to change all the method signatures to pass through uh, the initialization arguments, then you can make the initialization more generic and simply use key value pairs. So yes, you still have to extend the signatures, but all you pass in is a map of key value pairs. That has the advantage of not making the interface more complex, but it gets more dynamic. And now maybe you made a mistake maybe you're passing along key value pairs to and to identify the attribute the initializing values and you made a typo made a mistake it's all dynamic you'll only know too late or you simply return the empty object and do the initialization in a later step because it's not needed to initialize right away finally we didn't discuss that much but once you have that initial object and have it set up you could build the complex object structure again. There's a default, which is probably the empty object or the statically initialized object. But cloning, again, gives you that complex uh, structure of the original clone, uh, which might well be a fully populated object graph. Or you could uh, use something called the builder pattern, not much discussed here and that would trigger a building process, a stepwise process of creating the complex object structure that you're looking for. So what I just uh, discussed is exactly uh, that. Here is basically a table or an inventory of what these different ways of uh, these six dimensions of creating objects look like and you might want to use that in your own work. So again, here's delegation on the spot, also in the method where you are, in another method of the same class or subclass or in a separate object. The um, uh, selection of the concrete class could also be hard-coded, could be done by a switch case statement, could be delegated to a subclass by way of a separate method, could be uh, uh, achieved by a coupling in a dual hierarchy or simply a fully flexibly defined mapping of one class to another. Configuration, uh, also hard-coded or by annotations like a an, uh, dependency injection or by a separate loaded configuration file. This makes it from easy to read, hard to change to easy to change not so easy to understand.
the instantiation again everything's always in code code and then uh, by different ways of um, reifying the creation process and moving it into different objects either a class object or a prototype or a function object initialization by way of in different ways of passing on parameters uh, or simply delaying that initialization until the object is returned to the client where they can finish the initialization. And finally, you may want to build complex structures, or either stick with the generic version or clone it or build it. And in this design space um, of six different aspects, patterns again are well-worn recurring combinations of how to handle the different choices in each of these six dimensions. And the good patterns really just pick out the specific combination of choices on a few aspects and are indifferent to the rest of it so that they don't over constrain what can be chosen. You can see this here how the factory method is a combination of delegation you do it in this object that's um, who gets through the job and then how to select the class well the subclass code does it uh, abstract factory how i'm interpreting it here without the uh, factory method hard coded into it only tells us it's a separate object who gets the work delegated to woohoo Prototype combines the most thing. It's a separate object that does the job. There's a lot of subclassing in there because uh, well, different prototypes for different classes and the instantiation by cloning and so forth. So this gives you an overview of uh, how the patterns choose or are used uh, or use this design space uh, to the fullest. And maybe there are more patterns that we didn't cover here yet, but that use these six aspects. So that's it from me today um, for the creation or the patterns of how to create objects. We covered a lot of ground, uh, though I hope some of the design patterns you already knew, like factory method and abstract factory. Um, these are very common design patterns. And even if you haven't studied the design patterns book in detail, you probably knew them. But what I hope was new or at least interesting is that you can put these and some other patterns next to each other, break it down into the constituents aspects of what it means to create an object. And having seen these variations now, be more judiciously able to say, oh, my specific context of solving my specific problem asks that I Delegate it to the method, um, how I want to create an object but not a separate object, um, hard code the class and subclasses, and are fine with a default initialization, for example. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention, and see you uh, next class. I'll see you next week in class again. Bye bye, until then.